I think we will have a small value. Opportunity to discuss with four incredible persons, and uh, uh, I think it's high time uh, to uh, have a, a view of the strategic importance of human space flight. And it's going to be the main topics of this today discussion with uh, our four astronauts. Before this, uh, I know we have a, a little surprise uh, for for you all. Uh, with uh, a flag uh, that is, uh, uh, you may have a look to a screen, I guess. Uh, if you can put the flag on screen, please. Uh, I, I invite you all to have a look at this uh, uh, small flag, if we can display it on the screen. Here it is, okay, it's on the screen here. Uh, well, this is the flag of the, of the first French fighter squadron, uh, very precious to this Air Force Academy, uh, and with a rich history, and it's actually flying on the ISS with Thomas Pesquet. Now, we wanted to start this conversation by showing you this, this uh, flag. It's, I know it's a very symbolic and even a very emotional moment for many persons here in this room. And uh, it shows how much important it, it can be to create all these links over the years. And this is a very rich history uh, symbol for, for, for the, the French Air Force. So um, as I said, uh, we have uh, uh, the chance to, to have with us uh, four astronauts. And I know that for many, many, and even all of you uh, and all of us, uh, this is a uh, of course, this is a dream <laughs> to gather on stage uh, uh, such heroes. Um, and, and three astronauts on stage and one online in a, in a moment uh, for a, a brief, but I think very intense, intense, intense moment. And I'm sure the, the discussion we, we will have uh, will transport us in space and maybe in your universe uh, to uh, 
Also, to address the strategic dimension of the of, of, of human spaceflight, now it's it's a, a very rich uh, period of time, you know, that has, that is covered by the career of of those personalities. I will not go through a complete presentation of each of your of your panelists. Uh, uh, career, uh, given your extensive career, your extensive experience, but I would like to recall maybe some highlights of your professional, uh, professional accomplishment. And I will start with uh, Cl Claudie, Mrs. Claudie Nure, uh, who has had a, a wide-ranging career as a, as a physician, as, as an astronaut, and also as a minister uh, um, in uh, You've been minister in 2002, and uh, uh, where you were heading research and new technology, and also you also been uh, minister in 2004, uh, where you were in charge of the European affairs in the then government. But your career as an astronaut has been equally rich and, and provided you uh, with a large experience based on, the, on your scientific background, maybe, and on the capability you had to adapt this uh, background to this uh, opened a new horizon uh, with, with, with manned space flight. Your astronaut career started in August 1996 uh, with the first flight aboard the Russian uh, Mir space station. Uh, you have uh, also uh, a, a mission in 1999 and uh, you have been part of the astronaut European group at this very same day. And uh, you have been, and it's been said already, you have been the first French uh, astronaut, women astronaut, uh, to fly aboard the ISS. And thank you for being with us today. Uh, we have with us also General Jean-Pierre Aignoret, uh, who has uh, uh, graduated from this academy in 1971, and you became a fighter pilot in, in 1973. And uh, as early as 1985, uh, you have been uh, uh, selected as an astronaut for the French Space Agency CNES. And uh, you integrated the Hermes, the then Hermes program, the French program for developing a human rated uh, space vehicle uh, at this time. From 1991 to 1999, uh, you have uh, trained for four missions and you performed two flights uh, with uh, the Soviet Union, Russia, and uh, aboard the Mir station also. And you have had on the second mission the opportunity to perform extravehicular activities. Uh, you have been chief and you even created, in fact, uh, the European astronaut group. Uh, you have been also the head of the Soyuz program uh, for the uh, European Space Launch Center in Kourou, in Guyana, Guyana, French Guyana. And uh, you are now uh, you, you, you're pursuing your career by being involved in reflections on how to uh, uh, maybe uh, promote uh, programs uh, for sending uh, human in, in, in future space vehicles that are accessible to uh, to the private sector also. And we have also with us uh, General Leopold Rias. Uh, you are also graduated from this academy uh, in 1977, and you became also a fighter pilot in, uh, in 1980. In 1990, you've been selected as an astronaut for CNES. Uh, and you have uh, also integrated the Hermes program, which was at the time the main French um, uh, effort in the manned space flight program. You also had the, the opportunity to rapidly uh, uh, work with ESA, uh, and you uh, have been part of a, uh, you have also had experience uh, with the Soviet shuttle uh, Buran, and I think you, you've been uh, 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 you've had the, the opportunity to uh, uh, fly or simulate fly on, 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 the, on the Buran uh, uh, simulator. Uh, your first flight uh, to the uh, station, to the Mir station, dated back February 1998. 
uh, and you have stayed for 20 days then at this time aboard the Mir station. And your second flight uh, has been directed towards the International Space Station, the ISS, uh, in uh, 2008 aboard the Space Shuttle, the US Space Shuttle. Uh, and you will uh, participate to uh, set up the uh, European laboratory attached to, to the ISS. Uh, this mission uh, was, has lasted for 48 days uh, then. And you're today supporting the, the European Center for, for Astronauts. So again, a, a very, uh, a very uh, complementary experience among, among you three. And we will have with us, of course, uh, General Jean-Luc Chrétien, a little bit later in, 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 uh, in this round table. And General Chrétien is uh, also a very well-known French astronaut, has been the first uh, uh, French selected astronaut in the 80s. Uh, General Chrétien has had an extensive uh, uh, experience uh, with the uh, uh, Russian and Soviet uh, manned spaceflight program. He has been part of, of many missions also. Uh, he also performed uh, um, extravehicular activities uh, at this, at this occasion. And, and uh, he has also had an experience with uh, flying with the United States aboard the Space Shuttle in 1997. And afterwards, he's uh, 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 been uh, uh, supporting uh, a work with the ISS in the United States. So we'll have, uh, with these four uh, astronauts, uh, a very wide um, tour d'horizon, I would say, of, uh, of the uh, uh, history of manned spaceflight and also of the uh, different dimensions and aspects of uh, covered by man-man space flight. So basically this conversation will be structured along two main parts. The first part will uh, we'll try to um, explore uh, the issue of cooperations in, 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 in the domain of the man space flights, uh, especially in the context maybe, and we will start by this, in the, in the, last, of the last year of the Cold War, uh, space was one of the few domains where international cooperations could uh, develop uh, in a general context that was not very much favorable to international cooperations, and particularly in the technical, uh, highly uh, advanced technical areas like this. So I, I will have question on, on, on this, of course. And the second, a second uh, uh, part will, uh, will address maybe the current evolution of space programs, of course. Uh, we will certainly address the moon, uh, future moon horizon perspective for exploration, and, uh, and maybe uh, longer term objectives. And um, before that, I would like to start maybe with uh, General Ignore, Jean-Pierre Ignore. Uh, maybe you might like to, uh, well, first maybe recall us the context of uh, uh, the Russian, French-Russian cooperation, space cooperation, in the case of, uh, of, of a manned space flight, as you discovered it at this time. What were your uh, first uh, uh, feelings about cooperating with the Russian side uh, in a domain that is, remains, uh, uh, of course, a strategic domain because of the technologies that are used, because of the, uh, 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 of course, the level of, of, of exchanges you might have with uh, your counterparts in, in, in Russia. So can you give us your first uh, uh, impressions on how it was and what were the evolutions at the time? But you mean the, the very day when uh, I started, the, ooh, ooh. I, I joined Russia to start my training? Absolutely. Work. Because in fact, the story is a bit before. Uh, yes, that's true. Uh, we'll have Jean-Luc Chrétien, we'll come back maybe a bit. A uh, bit uh, bef before be going there for the training, uh, we had a flight, the second flight of Jean-Luc Chrétien. And uh, since I was at the time working on the MS program, I was also the head of the uh, astronaut office, French astronaut office. And as such, uh, I had the opportunity several times to go to Russia to look after the training of jean loup and his backup, who was Michel Tonini at the time. And I remember, you know, that uh, I was, uh, I was uh, um, educated in, in this academy. I am from the Air Force and was a fighter pilot. I was fighter pilot during the Cold War. 
And every day, flying on my Mirage, I prepare in case we would be invited by the Soviet uh, to resist to this invasion. And the first time I visited my good friends in Russia, I remember the first time I was on the Red Square and I saw this, that was still at the time Soviet Union, I saw this red flag on the top of one of the tower of the, the Red Square. I had a strange feeling. See, this is, this is the thing for which I was training and training hard and ready to risk my life to go sometimes there. And now I'm coming there for training with the Russian. That was a very strange uh, feeling and very positive in a way. It means at the end the things were, uh, were concluding in a very correct way. And at this opportunity sometime, you know, I was still what we named candidate astronaut, which means that I was selected astronaut, but I didn't fly yet. So I was not an astronaut. And as such, uh, uh, I wanted to participate to this training when I visited my friends in Russia. I wanted to participate a little bit to this training to see what it is, to play, to play the astronaut as well together. And I remember having training sport around the stadium in Star City, the training center of the cosmonaut, where, and they had a sports session and we were making cross around. And they had a left-hand colonel of the, uh, of the Red Army as a sportive trainer who was, who was uh, running uh, behind me. And I remember when I was a fighter pilot in Colmar, we were training for uh, what we named evasion, circuit evasion, in case we would uh, bail out uh, be behind the line. And I say, uh, and at the time I was uh, very often to encourage me running, say run, run like if you have a, a red soldier before be behind you. And this is exactly what happened at the time. So it was a very strange feeling. Besides that, what uh, people don't uh, realize uh, very much when they see an uh, astronaut at the TV making uh, salto and uh, uh, bubbles with the water, they think it's all fun. Uh, but the time we spend in space, also I had the chance to spend a little bit more time than usual, uh, the time we spend in space is small compared to the training. And being an astronaut mainly is uh, being behind a chair and uh, listening a Russian uh, uh, instructor telling you how to, uh, whatever, or the Russian technology. Uh, that doesn't answer uh, your question about uh, Russian technology. I mentioned. That was uh, your intention. Russian technology, you know, is uh, very different, but in a way uh, very comfortable, at least the one we are trained on, a Soyuz uh, spacecraft, Soyuz system. It is very much like, uh, I don't know if you know what is a matryoshka. Matryoshka is a thing of puppet that you, you buy and you open the puppet and you have a smaller one uh, endlessly. The Soyuz system is matched in such a way. The most sophisticated layer is outside, but if this sophisticated, sophisticated layer, which is more likely to, to fail, fail, then you go, in the second is the next uh, layer, which is not as comfortable, as performant, but still makes the mission. And you have several, if you, I'm not going to describe the technical system of the Soyuz, but it is very much designed in such a way. Compared to uh, Western technology, like the shuttle, but also the Airbus and Ariane 5 at the time, which is based on the concept of multiplex, which means that in case of failure, you have another system exactly the same, which runs at the same time together, and a, a third one, and the last secours, as we say, uh, but with the inconvenience that if, if the first fail because of a uh, concept, uh, uh, concept problem, the second, uh, the second system is going to fail as well. It's mm -hmm. exactly what happened for the first flight of Ariane 5, for instance. Uh, uh, not speaking of the concept uh, of the engines themselves, rocket engine, which are using liquid kerosene and liquid oxygen, which is very comfortable because at any time if there is a problem on the rocket, you can shut the valves. There are three valves. If only one of the three is, is closed, that shut, shut off the engine mm -hmm. and then eject the crew 
that can be recovered safely on the ground. So if it's com comfortable, not in a way you feel like uh, in a limousine, huh? <laughs> sure, certainly not, but it's very comfortable in terms of, of safety. And uh, I like it. Also, the ergonomy is not uh, the best quality of the system. And it's very difficult. It needs a lot, a lot of training. But it's valuable for the one, you know, like uh, we, we have before us uh, many uh, future pilots, maybe already pilots. But the more attractive, more interesting uh, craft are the ones who, who are not easy, who, who defend themselves. And when you succeed in mastering the bit, you are very proud of you. And that was, in the way, the case of Soyuz, valuable. So, so in a sense, um, Russian space was used to uh, work in a degraded mode, in, in default mode, and with the, uh, re, you know, uh, alternative uh, possibilities to go m more deeply inside the system itself, maybe in a less user-friendly manner, but it's still workable at some point, and this is uh, a particularity you feel like uh, of the, of the, at this time at least, of the, of the Russian space uh, philosophy, in a sense. And, uh, Claudie and Yore, on your side, you have had an experience uh, both as an astronaut but also as a scientist, and you have extensively worked with uh, your Russian counterparts. And what, what kind of feelings do you have when you think uh, of, of these years as uh, in terms of uh, how the, this international cooperation, you know, help you better understand maybe and uh, better characterize uh, how, it, how this was working? Okay, uh, I'm really happy to be with, uh, with you today and I think we are, three of us, a little bit witnesses of the 20th century <laughs> and uh, I would say uh, Apollo generation some, somewhere. And uh, I had this privilege to see a lot of changes. Um, I arrived in 92 for my first training, and my first flight was uh, in, in 96, in 92. It was just a transition between USSR and uh, Russia, uh, with the French-Russian cooperation in a military environment. I was not a military uh, candidate and astronaut at the, at the time. And um, then I had the chance to see scientific cooperation, operational cooperation, step by step, I would say. There was trust and confidence between French teams and the Russian teams. And then came the first European astronaut working there in the Euromir mission. It was in 1995. Uh, and then I had the chance during my mission in 96 in the Mir station to be with a crew that came with a shuttle. It was the first shuttle Mir so that means on the operational point of view, you can imagine something, uh, a big change in the system. And then we enter in this cooperation to develop the International Space Station. So that's really a landscape that is uh, a changing a lot. So that means it's not purely a scientific adventure, a technological adventure, but it's also a human adventure with all this uh, relation. And it was really interesting. Uh, on the field of um, science, I would say that for me, the International Space Station and the cooperation that we have uh, with our partners, and still now, and I hope for the future, we'll speak about Moon and, uh, and Mars, uh, is, an ISS is really a fantastic diplomatic tool. That means that we are able to work together even if there is some political stresses, uh, always with different uh, spaceships. So now we have SpaceX, but for a long, long time, it has been just a Soyuz vehicle able to uh, carry crew uh, in orbit. And uh, with um, sharing the data, sharing the protocols for the experiment, sharing the training too, and Laura said that very well, uh, that uh, she trained also Russian cosmonauts as well as Canadian with David Sanjak we have seen, or uh, American and other, other people. So really we work on the same experiment, we share the data, we try to think in terms of uh, acquiring new knowledge, but also preparing for the future, the two of the objectives for the, the scientific program board. 
but there is also a lot, there are a lot of changes in this field of science. I, I can witness that I was a science company. I had to open my box with my experiments because uh, the, when I came in the International Space Station, it was 2001. So just after the first steps of building of the International Space Station with two modules. So you can imagine, you have seen the with Thomas Pesquet, the ISS now with this huge volume and the different laboratories and the Columbus Laboratory, <laughs> Grasa um, Leopold. And, but at that time, we had no place. So there is also a, a lot of thing in this change of uh, camping science and laboratory science with, uh, with huge possibility uh, now. So, um, uh, and I hope really that uh, this aspect of uh, diplomacy by science can be something that will give us the possibility to go further in cooperation in operation, and why not uh, cooperation in thinking the future in terms of governance, as we discussed already this morning with this aspect of uh, free space with or without rules, with or without regulation for the, for the future. But at that time, and I said, and maybe Jean-Pierre could uh, speak about that, uh, the construction, the building of ISS was typically a multilateral agreement. That means the five partners were working together in order to define all the elements. I'm not sure that we are still in this configuration. We are in this configuration with uh, uh, ISS, but for the future, sometimes we see more multi-bilateralism than multilateralism in the way to organize the future. And I think we will have to take that into account. For sure, for, for all of us observers of uh, space, uh, the International Space Station remains the largest genuinely international uh, project, whether space or non-space, by the way, uh, involving a large, uh, a large amount of money, involving a, a long duration of time and many, many different partners. And I, 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 I've been very interested by your saying about um, that the science community, in a sense, and, and, and world has helped a lot, certainly, to keep this together, even if space agencies and, and the program itself was, was running. Uh, would you say, uh, what's your feeling, General Ayers? You've been participating extensively also to this ISS program. And, and, and from your perspective, uh, uh, what would you say of the efficiency of international cooperations at your level of, of a trend astronaut having to perform missions um, is that be, has it been uh, uh, something that's been difficult sometimes, or has it been always uh, very, very well organized and understood by all the different countries involved in the program? Um, hello, everybody. Can you hear me well? Okay. Yes. Um, before I answer the question, I just want to say that I'm uh, really glad to have been invited today here in this uh, academy. It's always a big motion to come back here and. Uh, um, I want to thank General Arbiol and, and, uh, and the Academy for, for this opportunity. Um, I think I was very lucky in my, in my, in my space career to, uh, to be able to, to see two different worlds, like uh, uh, Jean-Pierre and, and Claudine mentioned. So I was first exposed to the, uh, to the Russian uh, training to a station which was quite old, almost ending its, its, its lifetime. And, uh, uh, also flying with very experienced uh, cosmonauts. So one of them uh, was my first commander, was the uh, uh, former Soviet uh, exper experienced uh, cosmonaut. And um, uh, in the second, for my second mission, that was quite different, of course. Uh, I was uh, in, the, in the US for almost 11 years preparing for, for this uh, mission and uh, uh, in the beginning, I, I didn't even know on which mission I would be trained. So we started to train on the on the shuttle and uh, and on the station. Also, we were the, one of the first classes to be uh, trained for both shuttle and and uh, station. Uh, and, and it's only a few years after, uh, around 2004, that I knew that I would be flying uh, uh, finally uh, um, 
station mission as a station crew member, a long duration crew member, uh, but uh, flying also with the shuttle because at this time the, uh, um, the station was still in assembly and uh, it took almost 13 years to, to assemble the station. So uh, it was quite a long path toward the, toward the, the mission and uh, uh, not always easy. I, I was based in Houston, but I had to, to go to uh, for my first uh, assignment, I was assigned as a backup of uh, um, the first long duration European mission in the ISS, which was before Columbus, actually. And my, my, the, the prime uh, astronaut, uh, ESA astronaut, astronaut was uh, Thomas Reiter, was a German astronaut, and I was his backup. And so I had to, to go and train with him in Russia when I was based in, in Houston. And, uh, we spend a long, long time, uh, long, long weeks, and almost sometimes month in the, in Moscow, um, and training both in in, um, in Moscow and, and in Houston mainly. Uh, but I, I remember these times were quite hard from a, um, I mean, a fatigue standpoint, from a, um, also from a family standpoint because I was also uh, away. Uh, but in, in the Air Force, you know that, of course. But uh, for for long, long, uh, long, a long time away from uh, from home. And uh, but uh, of course, that was a tremendous. I learned tremendously during during uh, these times, during these four years of training um, on the, on the, the Russian side, on the U.S. side, of course, on the European elements also the, that we were carrying to the to the station and uh, delivering and assembling. So that was the. Complete, completely different, of course, environment and ecosystem that I was exposed to in, in these two uh, missions and, and two trainings. But uh, it was very uh, rewarding, actually. And I, I'm, I'm curious to know, uh, you just mentioned the fact that uh, a carrier, an asteroid carrier, is made of uh, highlights in a station and a lot of training time for many years. Uh, did you experience, maybe some of you, uh, the, the differences over the years of the relationship between, let's say, for example, France and, and the Soviet Union and Russia at this time? Did you experience some uncertainty due to this? Or uh, would you say that you have been, from the very start of your training until the, the first flight, you, you, there, were no, no, there was no doubt that you would fly aboard the station or Mir station? Or uh, Do you have a, an element of the political relationship uh, that might uh, that might have disturbed at some point or create uncertainties for you as an astronaut? I, th I think that uh, in the uh, uh, 80s and uh, beginning of the 90s, we were not sure of flying even af after having been selected. And that was, of course, uh, always something which was you had to, to live with and, uh, and it was not always fun, of course. But, uh, uh, fortunately, uh, there was, I think, a good um, uh, political continuation in the in the relationship, uh, bilateral relationship between France and uh, and the Soviet Union first, but uh, Russia after, uh, to be able to uh, to um, uh, negotiate more uh, fly more missions with the, with the Russians. And uh, uh, but uh, when I, I I remember that Claudia. Correct me if I'm wrong, but when we started the training in '95, so you we were assigned for the '96 mission. The uh, the next mission was not decided at that time. It was decided a little bit after, if I remember well, and that was the same for the mission that Jean-Pierre flew, the long duration mission. Yeah. So that was the uncertainties of these times. But then this change, of course, with the uh, with the European Space Agency and the integration of all the uh, national astronauts in the in the European Space Agency. So this became very different because then there was a uh, better perspective of, of missions and even if, unfortunately, that would mean also less missions overall for, for French astronauts, but that's part of the deal. Yes, yes, yes we, we have entered and, and Laura maybe can uh, complete. Um, in, with this multilateral, multilateral agreement with uh, the different partners for ISS, in um, uh, not a game, but entre guillemets, a game of barter in order to exchange, for example, the Columbus module or uh, other elements that we will add as an added value from the contribution of Europe to the general project. 
And with this kind of barter, we can barter uh, crew time and crew presence on board. And that means it works pretty well because the European astronauts, you see one, sometimes two European astronauts on board the ISS per year. And you know that uh, even for the next step, for the cis lunar and the gateway uh, around the, the moon, we know already that there is three flight opportunities. We don't know exactly on the surface of the moon, but I think we are in negotiation for, um, for that. And I'm sure that you are all aware that uh, there is a selection, an ESA astronaut selection. Uh, you are too young, I think, for be the candidate for this one. But uh, in some years from now, there will be an, an, another one. And um, so we are preparing the, the next generation, maybe avec more certainty that flight opportunity will be there for them. But uh, even when you are a candidate, and then when you are still not, not yet assigned to a mission, I think one of the elements of a character of an astronaut is to be motivated and to be perseverant, determined, in, a, in order to, to go further. So that means you are not sure, but you do the best. You extract the best of yourself in order to, to, to be on, the, uh, on this path. And uh, yes, we have been lucky. It was not completely planned like that, but we had two flights opportunity. Uh, on, with a long duration flight, uh, flew on two different stations, you flew with two different vehicles. No, so. and, um, we were talking about the 80s, and, and Jean-Pierre, you have been involved uh, at a very high level in the Hermes uh, French program. Can you tell uh, us more about the conception of this program and a bit of its history. Why was it so much importance for France at this time uh, to uh, develop such a program? Uh, yes, that was, in fact, we have together with, not, not Leopold, who was selected before, but we're together selected in, in 85 uh, across a, a long process. I think it lasted at least uh, one, one year of selection. And uh, when the result came out with uh, seven uh, astronauts selected, four scientific pro profile and uh, three uh, pilot and, and engineer, uh, we were selected, but nothing behind. There was no, to join the, the previous conversation, we didn't have flight opportunity registered anyway to to convert this selection as an astronaut, as an astronaut who fly. And therefore, my first, uh, my first job was uh, to work. I, was, uh, I convinced the engineer working on Hermes. I, was, I just finished my period uh, of test pilot in uh, Bretigny. And uh, in fact, one of the main uh, reasons why I, I candidate for this selection of astronaut, remember that uh, that was or the third flight that would happen before the two of, uh, of Jean-Loup, enfin the one of Jean-Loup and uh, Baudry. And at the time, the astronauts were uh, selected for limited political agreement and uh, uh, solely to make a specific French experiment on board. And Hermès, at the opposite, was really the very first technology program and uh, me as a former, as a test pilot, because I continue to train as a test pilot, I was uh, dreaming to be not an astronaut, but a pilot in space, the pilot of, uh, of uh, uh, Hermes. Hermes came, Hermes program started the studies uh, in France in 78 around, but uh, in uh, 84, d during the um, uh, Council of Minister of ESA in Rome, 
uh, it was decided uh, to uh, to engage the problem the program of Ariane 5 the one of Columbus which at the time was a generic terms including many different many different things including a pressurized module for for the uh, space station freedom was the name at the time and proposed by uh, France, but which was not yet agreed by the member state of ESA, the program Hermès. For France, Hermès was interesting because if the Columbus uh, program, including MTFF, which was a free flyer station, was important, you want? Yes, I think. As we have, a, I think, a small window for connecting with jean loup yes. and we will, of course, uh, follow up on the other. Very interesting. I don't want to burn the t <laughs> I don't have my big job, big boss. <laughs> but I think we have uh, jean loup Chrétien, oh. Gérald Chrétien, with us online. So I will, Let's of go course, then. give him the floor because I know he's very uh, constrained by by schedule. So uh, please, Gérald Chrétien, you have the floor. Welcome. Oh. English, we can't hear you. Uh, just we have a. Can we have the sound, please? Okay. Do you? Can you hear us? Yes. I can hear you. I okay. don't know if you hear me. We can. We can hear you now. Thank you. You have the floor. Okay. okay. But do we have to speak? Do you have to speak English or French? It's going to be in English because we have a number of uh, uh, foreign guests with us. Okay, I have a text to read, which is ready in French. I did not prepare it in English, so can I uh, can I say that a few words to the people of the Air Force Academy in, uh, in French? Okay. okay. And then we can shift in English for some maybe little exchanges. Please go ahead. En français, s'il vous voulez. Okay, donc en français. After that, I will go back to English language with the American accent. You see, I flag French and US okay, cooperation. Bonsoir, mes amis. Les circonstances exceptionnelles me privent du plaisir d'être physiquement parmi vous ce soir. Je tiens néanmoins à venir vous saluer et saluer cette grande école qui fut la mienne de 1959 à 1961, une grande dame. J'ai beaucoup appris sous l'aile de grands noms de notre histoire et le commandement vivant de grands chefs eux aussi entrer dans l'histoire de l'air et de l'espace. Je n'oublierai jamais ce grand moment d'émotion quand je rapportais ici votre drapeau en 1997. Il m'avait tenu compagnie tout au long de ma dernière mission à bord de la navette Atlantis à l'automne de cette année 1997. Vous avez donc choisi les métiers de l'air et de l'espace que j'appelle la troisième dimension pour faire plus simple et tenter d'effacer les dernières frontières de village qui ne manqueront pas d'exister entre ces deux domaines qui rapidement n'en feront plus qu'un. Ingénieurs, mécaniciens ou pilotes, certains d'entre vous deviendront astronautes et cosmonautes. Vous volerez plus haut physiquement, mais moralement, vous, nous, volons à la même altitude, celle des grands rêves devenus réalité devenu votre, notre mission. Ces missions, un jour, vous conduiront loin, très loin. Vous serez alors livré à vous-même face à un destin parfois empli de tourments et de dangers auxquels vous ferez face, souvent seul. Vous vous souviendrez alors du maillon fragile que vous êtes, dans cette chaîne essentielle à l'avenir de l'humanité. Un maillon précédé de ceux de vos anciens, vite devenus désuets, tant sont rapides les enchaînements du progrès. 
vous serez alors encore plus conscient de la force, de la solidité de cette chaîne, de la, solidari de la solidarité de ces maillons, et vous accomplirez votre mission avec passion et dévouement, en toute simplicité. Et c'est dans cette simplicité que vous affronterez si souvent l'inconnu et les dangers, et vous rappellerez de votre devise, de notre devise, faire face. Voilà, bonsoir à tous. Merci, on mon général. Terminé. Just, on a juste une question pour vous qui est apparue sur l'écran ici et venant d'une audience très, très large en réalité. Elle est formulée en anglais. Est la, la question est la suivante. What is the greatest memory you have of your whole astronaut career? Uh, what is the greatest memory? Okay, you can imagine that we have a lot of events in uh, memory. Uh, among them, the most fascinating one was the extravehicular activity. And uh, six hours in outer space, that's something you cannot forget. Going around the Earth many times, I let you do the calculation, you should be able to do that. And uh, looking at Earth and being able to see a lot of details on the surface of the planet, this is something that you cannot forget. So probably in my memory, one of the most fascinating events. Thank you, thank you for this. Uh, uh, thank you for this intervention also. I know that there are a lot of questions in the room, certainly. Uh, we have opportunity to discuss, uh, of course, there's uh, 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 certainly this uh, um, incredible uh, activity. You have been the first to, uh, uh, to perform for, for, for France. Uh, I have a, another question also for you, uh, which is, well, what are in your eyes the main strategic issues, strategic issues associated with human spaceflight? Would you say that this is a strategic domain? The time is going fast, and we have a tendency to forget about that and to stop by very easily. Again, time is going fast. We have started space exploration already for more than half of a century, and we won't go further down. And the main problems that we will face during the extension of this exploration phase is the unification of the needs and, uh, and the tools on Earth to go further and further down. Looking back at our planet, that will be just a small point in the sky and forgetting and having to forget that we come from different countries. We will come from Earth. Right now, it's not important. We are flying at 400 kilometers over the surface of Earth. Pretty soon, we'll be flying on the moon. That's already much more, 300,000. And I hope that some days we'll be flying on Mars and maybe, maybe somewhere else in the solar system. But again, the main challenge is to be able to unite our efforts and to be looking at space from one planet, planet Earth, from one country, and uh, that has resolved most of its uh, problems. Mm. And, and maybe a last question, uh, looking forward, as you just said, I have a question which is this one. Who is going to build the next spaceship to the next mission to the moon, do we have an idea of the technology, uh, of what the tech, which technologies will be retained for this? Uh, what is your take on, uh, on, on future technological accomplishments for going to the moon? Well, right now I'm working in uh, Houston, six months a year, uh, close to NASA, and I can say that uh, John Space Center, but of course the rest of uh, NASA, plus uh, contractors, are uh, working hard 
on the next goal, which is to land on the moon in a few years. It was 2024, it's supposed to be 2024, but most of us know already that this won't be possible, but we might be very close to, to that day. And uh, the tools to get there are in development. We, we have the knowledge for everything. We, we don't need to do a lot of research to be able to land on the moon uh, that soon. The biggest problem that we didn't have, that people did not have in at the time of Apollo, is the money, the budget. We need to do it with the actual budget, which is a little bit more than 20, 000, uh, billion, 20 billion of uh, dollars. And uh, this, this is uh, tricky. With that, it's quite difficult to to fulfill uh, that uh, that program, but we, we can do it. Okay, and, and maybe uh, the very last question, it's been asked in French, but I will try to formulate it in English. It's very much related to the academy today. Uh, how much your training here at the Air Force Academy has been info important for you in your astronaut career? And I will May ask, I may ask this also to other panelists here. How much important it has been for you to, to retrain here, to be a pilot, uh, to become an astronaut? The Air Force Academy, all of us joined the Air Force Academy in their 19, 20 years old. That's very young at the time um, in life when you can be very easily formatted and that what happened. The Air Force Academy at that time, and I, I guess it's the same now, I'm sure it's the same now, is give, giving you the best tools to face uh, your professional life. I was a fighter pilot and uh, I started to fly very early. I was uh, 15 years old when I started to pass my license. So the, uh, I competed in all of that at the Air Force Academy. But the most important in the, uh, in the time at the Air Force Academy is the human knowledge, your human relation, the military relations, the military knowledge, the engineering knowledge, and to keep you curious, to keep you modest, because uh, you realize very quickly that uh, life Professional life won't be easy, that you will need to work in a team. You won't be on yourself working in a team with other people, understand who is able to uh, make the challenge. People will be better than you. You will be better than others and understand that's a teamwork and uh, to give the hand every time you feel that uh, you, you won't be the best. That's not very easy for a fighter pilot. Thank you very much, General Chrétien, for this uh, uh, this participation to our panel. I know your schedule is very constrained, so I don't want uh, maybe to, make, to take too much of, of your time. So we thank you very much, and we thank you deeply for having been able to, to be on stage with us, in a sense, uh, even if it's online, of course. So uh, uh, thank you very much, General Chrétien, uh, for your participation. All right. Thank you. And I may have the same question maybe for the two <laughs> persons who have, and we will go back to Emmys, by the way, but because to follow up on this, uh, the, the, the importance of having been trained uh, as a fighter pilot uh, for becoming an astronaut, even if uh, Mrs. Enyore has not been trained as a, as a fighter pilot, but you have had a scientific career, which may, may bring another perspective to the astronaut career. What, what would you say, uh, Jean-Pierre? I think uh, Jean-Lou perfectly described uh, my personal feeling. I, I, was, uh, I didn't come from a military school before the academy, so I'm pure, uh, what's the name here, the Pékin. <laughs> I was a Pékin. But uh, I think uh, the, the two things uh, that are the identity of the academy is uh, to be an officer first, 
this uh, academy from officers and to be an aviator. So they are officier aviator. This uh, summarizes very much the two things which attracted me. What means uh, uh, being an officer uh, and what do we learn in our military uh, training is uh, the, spirit, uh, the team spirit, the uh, respect of the mission, the uh, the uh, obstination to reach uh, the results, the uh, mutual uh, support, uh, uh, the sense of discipline, so certainly. And all the satisfaction, satisfaction that you receive of, uh, by observing these rules. Uh, you are always, uh, you feel comfortable in your body when you follow these simple rules, and that helps you uh, so very often to solve problem which seems uh, co uh, complex at first uh, view uh, and that thanks to this team spirit, the respect of the other, the possibility to work and complete together uh, helps you to, uh, we, uh, very often uh, we said the people coming from, from the force, uh, especially the Air Force I would say because uh, a fighter pilot is some very often uh, uh, at the end alone to solve the problems that have been prepared by the user. But uh, th this is a particularity of, of this uh, academy I think, beside the academics which is giving some culture, engineer culture. It's very important to have this engineer culture, it helps you very much in the life as well. It's really a job of passion with a high personal involvement, in fact. Uh, I think you, you would just repeat maybe what has just been said about this link with the Academy uh, on your side. Uh, of course, yeah, I, I can only agree with what has been said by uh, Jean-Louis and by uh, Jean-Pierre. And uh, there are two very important things that the values and, and the skills that you receive when you are in this school and, and the team spirit also, of course, uh, will be um, will be helping you to succeed in anything you do, not only to, be, to become an astronaut, but to, to do anything you want, you want to do beyond your, your uh, <clears throat> in the Air Force first and, uh, of course, after your, uh, your Air Force uh, career. So that's, uh, that's Claudia, great on your side, you base had a for starting. <laughs> a slightly different career. If, if I may, uh, it, it's... Um, yeah. Uh, I think you can find this kind of uh, value in other domains too, and I'm so proud to be a medical doctor, to be a scientist, and the truth that this team working is also something, the exigence, the excellence, the reasoning, and the quality of the implementation. I think we share that for our career as an astronaut, and we learn that in different uh, entities. But uh, yeah. I, I think that's important to, to try to be, to faire face, mm -hmm. because uh, for sure, <laughs> may I, as a colonel of Réseau Adair, to say faire face, uh, appropriation too, uh, and to, to be able to cope with yeah. a complex situation that you have encountered in other, other field too. And uh, I learned that, but uh, I think that during the training, I became not a member of the academy, but I learned a lot. That's always a growing process when you learn and you learn. I'm sure that you learn also something. But we learn flying as well. You don't learn flying. <laughs> that makes a difference. Yes. To be a pilot is something very important. <laughs> okay, so it's okay. <laughs> there is a corporate uh, dimension to that. Uh, I just wanted uh, uh, to remind the audience, in fact, I forgot to say it, that in fact you can ask questions by using uh, the following uh, mail address, email address, which is seminarespace uh, at ecole-air.fr. Uh, you might use, so it's Seminaire Espace, it's completely uh, joined at uh, ecole-air.fr. You might use this web address to ask a question that will be sent to me <laughs> on this screen. We are using uh, several systems, you know, it's a complex uh, thing, but it's working, so please don't hesitate. Um, I wanted to come back on this MS thing because uh, it's something that's personally uh, I've, I've, I've been of a uh, lot of interest to me. Uh, 
this program and maybe uh, uh, yes, you can also understand this as 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 uh, as has been uh, envisioned on the long term. There has been a, a, a lot of uh, political involvement behind it. And yeah, but there is a context as well. The, context, yes. the context is the, uh, on one side for the German, it was pass labs. Pass labs that was a pressurized module that uh, were supposed to be installed in the cargo bay of the shuttle and in which uh, uh, the uh, scientific made uh, some experiments. Uh, this uh, space lab had been designed by the German and uh, they were uh, a bit troubled or not uh, completely satisfied by the fact that they couldn't share the result, scientific result inside and the IP as well, the, uh, the uh, intellectual property of uh, what they designed. And uh, on, one side, on the other side, on Europe, we uh, had Ariane, which started to be very successful. We already had catch 50% uh, of the free market of satellite, of launch satellite. Uh, in CNES, I remember, in 85, uh, the people were very, very uh, ecstatic about what they were doing, a bit aggressive in a way, or, or uh, arrogant in a way, because uh, Ariane uh, had a success because the shuttle was not a success as a satellite launcher. But uh, the uh, shuttle took off the first time in 81, that was my first time in Boscombe Down, I remember, and in this context, uh, and also the uh, political context was Mitterrand, whose brother, Robert Mitterrand, had been uh, head of the Aerospatiale. So uh, for the first time, with the German, like the French, agree on uh, the necessity to uh, get some autonomy, access to space for man flight, uh, un peu grisé, hein, uh, by, by, the result, by the success of uh, Ariane. Uh, Besides that, the industry uh, wanted very much to experiment the hypersonic regime. Uh, our NERA has worked hard on, uh, on this context uh, in Stato Reactor as well, uh, Scramjet. Uh, they made the theoretical uh, studies on, uh, on uh, the code of uh, hypersonic reentry uh, in the Earth, but we didn't have. Um, how to say, this uh, theoretical, theoretical code had to be uh, validated by the experience. And therefore, the field of research around the space plane was something which excited, at the same time, the industry. CNES uh, has an offer in the European theater to get the autonomy of access uh, to space. And politically, uh, when the, the success of the shuttle guided the engineer of CNES to do something comparable but different. So the, the American had their uh, autobus, aut car, autocar, and uh, uh, Hermes would be the taxi, bringing three people in space. And the interest also, operational interest of Hermes, is that it would be a client for Ion 5. Because the problem we have in Europe is when we have launchers, we don't have enough uh, institutional launchers to cover the necessary number uh, uh, to uh, maintain a chaîne de montage, an assembly. Uh, uh, an assembly. Uh, so everything was going very well together. The only problem is that Ariane 5 didn't uh, work much together because the concept was to consider that the base of Ariane 5 would be the engine and you could do with this engine either the automatic flights with automatic satellite as a satellite launcher or if you remove the satellite you put Hermes on the top and uh, you perform this is now the engine of, uh, of a space plane. That was uh, charming. The only problem is that uh, Ion 5 had in priority to be designed for the automatic mission because, uh, in fact, the root of the uh, uh, political intention be behind, the, behind this uh, different object is to have, thanks to a launcher, a free access to space, especially for military uh, 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 institutional uh, satellites. Therefore, the design of Ariane 5, and in particular, the performance in terms of 
ton delivered in low Earth orbit was guided by the uh, market of uh, geostationary satellites. And the director of uh, Ion 5, who was Mr. Vignel at the time, we visited him very often to ask him more performance. We needed 25 ton in orbit to design a, a working space plane. And they started to offer us 18. Uh, and finally, uh, they hardly promised 23, but at the end, for, for different reasons, uh, we uh, uh, never get the performance which was necessary to, uh, to uh, lead the operation of the space plane. We were, uh, we say, in negative payload, something very cr crazy in terms of aeronautics, because when you build an aircraft, between the first... Uh, uh, theoretical weight of the aircraft at the beginning, if you uh, look at the curve in the time, is only increased, permanently increased. When we start from negative, you, you can never reach uh, the goal. And besides that, uh, we had in 87 the accident of Challenger, and that was really uh, destructive for the program because uh, for, uh, for Hermes, for, for Hermes, yes, we, um, it was supposed that the booster, on Ion 5, there are two big boosters on the cryogenic engine named Vulcan. The two boosters, when you light the booster, you cannot stop it. There is no way. And, uh, and there was no way, according to this engineer coming from, uh, from the ballistic missile uh, in aerospatial, because they, were, they had the reputation, the launcher, to be like a uh, petard, uh, when you burn it, it works. And uh, the coefficient of, uh, uh, of uh, come on, uh, failure, the coefficient of failure was estimated at uh, less than one over 1,000. So the uh, failure of a booster was not taken into account in the safety uh, assessment and profile of Hermes. When Challenger exploded, they had to. So we started to think about system to extract the crew in case of the blow up of one booster and that end up with no possibility in fact. But, and this is a question for you all, the fact that in this particular case France gave up the idea of an autonomous uh, human rated feel that today? Do you feel like we are, this has shaped, uh, in a sense, the European space program of today? Uh, do you feel like it may have been done and then it would have changed the whole uh, role, place of Europe, maybe as a partner in the ISS or, or not at all? Uh, how do you assess this uh, historical decision, in a sense? Maybe Claudie. <laughs> it's a general question, I know. Okay, but no, speaking, for example, of this uh, next steps that will be uh, around the moon and mm. on the surface of the moon. What is the place of Europe uh, in, in in that field? And it was a question about this strategic component of human spaceflight. I, I think for me, there is there something strategic. Um, it concerns the future of humanity that will go beyond through exploration and we know that it's already there. There is a rush to the moon, maybe a moon race, but a rush to the moon <laughs> in, the, in the next future. And we know that this kind of mission are costly, that, that means that we need to do that in cooperation or maybe with different uh, field of cooperation in the blue and the red uh, as the exercise for tomorrow. Um, maybe you will have to choose or maybe you can be the mediator in, in between the two, uh, the two elements. So uh, I think if um, we want to be part of the discussion of the negotiation of the rules um, of this uh, element of the future of humanity, that's one step. And, uh, this path will be also a path for later on, for, uh, for Mars. If you are not in, or if you are a junior partner, I would say, 
it will be difficult to be around the table of a, a negotiation and a really contributing. So that's why I hope that we may have a European vision and a European um, contribution can be access to space, human, ex uh, human rated access, can be something else, can be energy, can be uh, logistic, can be a communication, I don't know. But something that is not just um, a junior partnership, but a true partnership, an essential partnership. And for that, uh, uh, I think that's strategic, not just for human space right, but for the voice of uh, Europe and for France uh, in that. Uh, and I think um, we need to, to put that on the table and to be sure that we have enough ambition to be there further. Thank you. Yes, Jean-Pierre, you wanted to add some. Your, your very question, uh, what, do you, what did you feel at the, uh, at the end of the MS program? Uh, we felt, I felt, at the time uh, I was already uh, starting my first training in Russia. Uh, I, I, I felt uh, not much surprised because when permanently we never reached a positive payload, you know. So, from, and I admire the morale of the director of program, who, beside every evidence, started to trust in his program and uh, tried to find solutions. That was Mr. Uh, uh, Kuya at the time, the excellent director. Uh, and we, f I felt. Uh, Miss, uh, that we had a missed opportunity because the men that we saw on the on the screen there at the time I remember in eighty six uh, between eighty two flight nineteen eighty two he uh, uh, proposed when we saw that he, because there, there was other problem besides that to, to put a wing at the top of a rocket is something which is a bit crazy because a rocket is uh, basically unstable. If you add profiles which uh, reinforce the unstable character of the rocket, uh, it starts to be very difficult, and it's, we had problem with that. So we had a proposal to do a capsule, re reusable capsule, more or less what uh, Elon Musk is doing now. And we could use all the materials, the carbon-carbon nose uh, that was designed for MS, we could use it for a capsule. And if we had made the capsule, we could have reached the program within uh, the uh, price envelope, obviously, because it's far less difficult uh, to build than a space plane. And today, or at least uh, this uh, last year, we would have the Europe the continent who uh, were bringing the uh, U.S. astronaut uh, into the space station rather than by Russian Soyuz. So that was really a missed opportunity for mostly political reasons. Yes, even uh, maybe a diplomatic missed opportunity. I, maybe, John uh, Lyons, you want to add a word on this and you have the same feeling? Being um, <coughs> I think we cannot stress enough the importance of cooperation in this, especially as far as human spaceflight is concerned, because these programs are very expensive. And uh, uh, today, uh, there is no country, no single, single country which can afford uh, to go alone to the moon or to go alone to Mars or whatever. Um, so <clears throat> cooperation is very important. And I think that's what the uh, International Space Station program demonstrated that uh, uh, this is a key of su success today. It was able to bring together countries like the US and, and, and Russia and uh, of course uh, the, the Japanese and Europeans and Canadians and, and uh, this has been also the base for, for the future uh, lunar station even if there are a lot of uncertainties I think in my opinion frankly on, on, on the uh, current state of this uh, uh, lunar and or um, Artemis program. Uh, very often, big programs are the choice of one uh, government or one administration. And uh, I think that uh, continuing on cooperation, uh, I th in my opinion, the uh, the choice which has been made for, for instance, for the for the lunar gateway, the uh, this uh, lunar station, uh, to continue the cooperation between the 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 um, the partners of the international space station was the right one 
uh, one of the problem I think will be a problem uh, um, will be a, um, a risk for this program in the future is to superimpose on on top of this the uh, Artemis Artemis program and uh, this could bring to uh, some difficulties in terms of partnership and in terms of cost also even if we bring uh, the the commercial partners in addition so we'll see what what the future will say but uh, yeah, i think that uh, continuing on with reasonable objectives reasonable budgets in cooperation is the key to 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 make these programs sustainable thank you um, I will now shift to the questions because we have many, as you can imagine, and I will try to group some of those questions and coming, I think, from this room and from elsewhere, maybe on the YouTube. Uh, so I, I just mentioned the question. At least three of us in this, in the assembly, uh, uh, are uh, dedicated to become astronauts. So do you have any tips for us? Thanks a lot. And I have another question close to this one. Uh, we had a number of space cadets uh, from Ecole de l'Air working as analog astronauts in our Euro Moon Mars bases and field campaigns since 2010 in collaboration with ESA ESTEC. Now, what are the prospects for space careers in the current, for the current cadets and how they could contribute to future activities including the Moon Village? Uh, <laughs> do you have, uh, and it's signed Prof. Fouin, <laughs> maybe uh, uh, coming from a well-known person. So uh, how do you see, I mean, okay, the question is, how can I become an astronaut and how can, can I make the best from my training here to, to become an astronaut and make a career? Uh, have you tips? And, and for them, those of people who have been invested more time in this, how they can benefit from this investment, and do we, is it something that is there is a recipe or <laughs> something they should do? I, I, I think an, being an astronaut is never a first job, so uh, it's this is always something that you do, in, let's say, in the second part of your of your career. So. The important thing first, and uh, especially when we have very young uh, cadets here, uh, it's to s start and, and, and do well with your first job because this will be the base for later for possible selection uh, as an astronaut or for other things. But uh, um, I, I think this is the key: is to be successful in your in your first job and and uh, uh, do all the best you can. Uh, besides your 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 job to maybe learn a lot on on the things you want to achieve later that's my only tip i would say okay to you yeah, yeah. Uh, and maybe to to have a dream that's one of the advice that i, I give always to the to the kids in school or the the student uh, whatever the, the dream to fly to be the pilot of hermes or to to be uh, uh, the next medical doctor in a moon camp um, to have a, a dream and to try to open and to explore beyond the, the, the limits. So that's true that you need to have a, a background, whatever the background, to have an, I would say, personal experience of this complex situation. And for that, the Euro Moon Mars can be something interesting to, to work all together, the, the team spirit in, a, in complex situation. It, it can be some, something useful. So the dream, the confidence, the trust that you may have in yourself and that you built with, uh, with your support. And uh, the path will be long, difficult, and it will be more difficult if you are alone. And you learn that you are never alone in your academy and, uh, and with your team. So this is important. OK, so I correct my understanding of the questions. It was not coming from this assembly. It was coming, I think, from outside audience. And the three persons were not uh, uh, 
a member of the <laughs> of the academy, and, and and I think the question was also coming from uh, the managers of the ESA program and how they could, uh, uh, what are the prospects uh, or spare careers for the cadets? And I would say, in a sense, uh, that's uh, um, addressed to the whole community here uh, uh, for the current cadets and how they could contribute to the to the future activities. I think this is a question that comes from outside, and it's an invitation, maybe. Uh, for the cadets to be part of this uh, global effort. So I, I, I did uh, maybe confuse this a bit. Uh, uh, now, questions on, on the ISS program. Uh, as the ISS program is coming to an end in the uh, coming years, do you think we will concentrate all of our efforts in the conquest of the Moon and Mars? Or will there be a remaining scientific international program right above us, like the ISS. Do you feel like we will still invest, we will go keep on investing in, in, in such a program after the end of ISS? Um, yeah, first what I'd like to say that it's not the end of the ISS program yet. Mm -hmm. I mean, we still have uh, at least another, I would say, seven years minimum, and uh, I mean, the partners are already talking about extending um, so this is definitely not the end of the program yet. And um, the, this cooperation, as I mentioned before, triggered also cooperation for the fut further exploration. But the question I would be raising is that um, uh, going to the moon um, does not prevent us from doing some uh, still science in the future around the Earth. We, we don't need to go to the moon to do, for instance, uh, microgravity, uh, fundamental science of uh, some human research on uh, the microgravity effects in the, in the future either. So uh, I, I'm, I'm convinced that there might be a, a follow-on to, the, to this, uh, to this uh, low Earth orbit uh, station in the future. The problem is to find out what it will be. It will certainly be less expensive that, or less uh, big in, in terms of architecture that uh, the ISS is, but there will be certainly a continuation. And if, if we want to also to, to continue um, human space flight for a lot of astronauts, we don't have to go to the moon or Mars because this will, be, this will mean less and less flight opportunities for the for the astronauts in the future, so it's very important to maintain also low Earth orbit operations in the future. Please. Please. Going back to science in ISS, uh, I said that uh, uh, I practice uh, science camping, and now that it's science and laboratory, but also different conditions. I think during the very beginning of the space station, there was not so much maybe coordination in the protocols in between the different partners. That means the reproducibility of the result was uh, difficult. And I've always uh, the question about specific physiological effect on women in long duration space flight. I say, we have no results about that because we have two or three subjects with the same protocol. So that's also the methodology of, of science. And at that time, because we was not able to collect the, the precise result, it was a descriptive period, I would say. It was description of the effect on the body, the description of the effect on the fluid or combustion. And now we have the power and the tool in the International Space Station to understand, to interpret, to collect data, to reproduce. So that's not at all the same kind of science, and it would be a pity to to, to leave the station, but for, we have more than uh, about 10 years, I hope, uh, working with uh, the laboratory, and maybe the future of the low Earth orbit will be also a complement of this institutional station, as we know it's uh, ISS, with private part. I would not say commercial one, but maybe private, because there is a lot of very, very interesting research to be done in microgravity that are not possible to do on Earth. And now, as we have the power and the tools to understand, to apply, to, to go further, 
I think that's really important. Yes, we have these new developments that might also affect this this activity in lower orbit. I have a question that comes back, uh, which is, how does it feel to come back on Earth, physically and mentally, <laughs> after flights in the space station and Mir, long duration flights? Uh, what would be your the feeling you might convey here? Um, it's important to have big target in life, but uh, when you reach one target, uh, you, you cannot do again and again the same. And especially uh, when you go so high in your dream, in your dreams, uh, you know that uh, life afterwards will be different. And uh, I think it's important to prepare yourself uh, be before to decide yourself what would be uh, your uh, last flight, space flight. This is comfortable. Everybody is not deciding that. Uh, there's not this opportunity of doing it. But if you know, if you have decided, then uh, you can prepare what you are doing next. Personally, when I flew from my uh, uh, last uh, long duration flight in Mir, and we were, by the way, we were the last. Uh, uh, crew on Mir, we left uh, nobody behind us, and uh, Mir had uh, 15 years in orbit at the time. So, concerning the previous question, uh, ISS is 20 years now, in 24, so 24 years. And I'm not sure that uh, taking into account the condition of Mir uh, when we left it, uh, I'm not sure that uh, ISS will go far beyond 24, frankly. Uh, uh, but as far as I'm concerned, then before this flight, I applied for being the head of the astronaut office in, in Europe, and I knew perfectly what I was doing. And uh, almost as soon as uh, I was on the ground, also usually after six months of flight, you, you need sometimes to recover a little bit physically, uh, not mentally, uh, physically at least. My uh, German director, future director, uh, was a director of the uh, Astronaut office, hey, Mr. Rengere, we are waiting you in Cologne. <laughs> that was almost the next day after my landing. We, we are waiting you very hard. We want this job. You, you must be there next month. And then you, you sink to the next. And uh, this is so true that I did uh, 1,000 slides. We were diapo on slides at the time. And I start looking at those slides three years later only, after the landing, because I had so much time to create this uh, function of head of the astronaut office that I, I even didn't have time, and I didn't want much to think about what happened before. This is important. But do you want to add a word? But um, I, I think that's really transformative experience. You are not the same after the flight. Transformative for you and transformative also in the fact that the, le regard des autres, the, the way you appear and you are considered by the other will change. So you can decide that, okay, you have two flights, uh, it will be the, the last one. And, uh, but you have also opportunities that will be offered to you because of this uh, change. And the change is, um, and, and for me it was uh, to be called to enter in the government of Jean-Pierre Raffarin under the presidency of uh, Jacques Chirac. I didn't decide at that time, but it was an opportunity offered after this uh, transformation. And um, something we did not uh, discuss at all, and I think that's something strategic somewhere, um, with uh, the overview effect. I'm sure that you know about the overview effect, the, the fact that through the window you, you see the planet, so you are really uh, a human uh, person and no more uh, from just the Earth, but also humanity. And you are also an ambassador after the flight, ambassador of the planet, ambassador of humanity, ambassador of cooperation, ambassador of science, and ambassador of the future. And um, okay, so it's not always you will decide something, you have always the, cho the choice, but sometimes you have new opportunities because of this uh, transformation of yourself and the, of the others. Talking about this overview effect, I heard astronauts several times 
mentioning the fact that when you see the thin layer of atmosphere, you become aware of the fragility of Earth and, and the fact that it's our spaceship in a sense. And did you have this kind of uh, awareness maybe of this? Uh, did it change the relationship you had with this, the consideration of a planet as our uh, protection, fragile protection against uh, uh, outside <laughs> threats? <laughs> Uh, I'm sure there is something to do, another seminar, another workshop <laughs> next <Okay>. year <laughs> about this, uh, this transformation. And, uh, because really, I think when you are out of the box, for example, on the moon or around the moon on, in orbit, you may think different relation, very, very differently relation with the planet, with the environment, with this fragility, but fragility of humanity, a relation with the assistance of uh, artificial intelligence, you said. So what will be in the future? Human assisted with artificial intelligence. Human and nature. There will be no nature on the moon or on Mars. So there is a lot to think also about the next step expansion of uh, humanity, not to leave the planet. The planet is wonderful. That's something that we can witness through the window. I have questions keep keeping, that keep coming. Uh, I will, at some point, we have to close this uh, panel. But still, I have two questions about Mars, in a sense. Uh, how strategic, in your eyes, would be a human flight to Mars? And there is a compa companion question, I would say. If you would have the possibility to be part of the next moon or even Mars mission in a few years, would you go and why? <laughs> Difference between moon and Mars. No for Mars, yes for the moon. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. And, and <laughs> well, do you have... a? <laughs> okay, so it would be a yes. <laughs> yes, please. I think there was some company proposing uh, uh, just a to-go flight to Mars with no return. Uh, I don't think I would choose that. I wouldn't like to have that. Um, I'm not sure this even this is even legal to to to, to offer such a thing. Um, but yeah, Mars is is a very different thing for me. I, I think this is not nothing to do with the moon mission. Even if we can use the moon missions for learning things to go to Mars, March is, is such a big step, I think, that we, we will not reach it soon or in the, in the next 20 years even, because it, it, this is too much of a step to, to reach technologically. We don't even know for, um, for a human survive, uh, survivability in this environment either. So. Um, I think we we have to be. Let's wait and see. Uh, yes, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Uh, I have Cautious. a question also that will I will translate. It's about the starship. Yours, it's a specific, more specific question. And the, the person is questioning himself about the um, the relevance of starship as a, as a, a ship that would be chosen for going back to the moon, and uh, is asking for your. Uh, feelings about you think this kind of transportation system and would would it be the only one and there should be some others? Um, a couple, of, uh, uh, couple of years ago I was asked to, to make a presentation on, on the f com comparing today's operations in the ISS with future operations on the moon. And that was something I found very difficult, actually, because uh, we don't really know what this uh, future program will be. And uh, I told before about the Lunar Gateway and the Artemis program, and I'm not sure um, yet how these programs are going along together. So it's uh, very difficult to describe. But uh, again, I think the important thing will be to uh, to have reasonable objectives and and uh, to ask to answer your question about starship this is one of the new developments uh, the, the the previous uh, american administration want to involve more commercial companies in the in the um, in the lunar missions and uh, but uh, this is another development and i'm not sure this will this will be really the the end of the of the story and uh, and the way the program will be uh, implemented, uh, and this is my personal opinion, of course, not the opinion of uh, 
I'm, yes. I'm retired from the European Space Agency and from a French Space Agency, and so um, this is my personal opinion. But uh, I think we are far from knowing exactly what this moon program will be. Things go so fast these days that uh, it's a bit difficult to project now, in, even in the near future. Uh, I have another question on the Chinese. Uh, since the recent Chinese accomplishments, uh, future Chinese space station, uh, between parentheses, how would you consider the future cooperation with this nation? Moreover, considering the fact that the ISS is planned to be uh, 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 to last only until 2024, 2028. Do you feel like the Chinese new interest for, well, it's not new interest, but in involvement, investment in uh, low Earth manned space flight, low Earth orbit manned space flight would be a, could be a, a replacement for cooperation? Yeah, but as, uh, as far as I know, there are discussions uh, between the European agency and the Chinese to to fly together with them. I mean, we have the, since we don't have our spacecraft, we we may cooperate. This is nature of Europe to cooperate since the beginning. The only period where we uh, trusted that we would have our own vehicle to go to space it was between eighty five and ninety two, the end of Hermes. Uh, apart from that, uh, the uh, the key uh, posture of ESA in uh, space flight, in manned flight, is the cooperation, permanently cooperation. And why not we, with the Chinese? Uh, we, have, we have during the last uh, 10, 20 years, we have uh, in parallel had cooperation with the Russian and with the American. And uh, why not uh, the, the Chinese? If yeah. the American allow us to do it, which is still to be proven. It's true that history has demonstrated that in space, cooperation can be very efficient, while in, on, uh, on the Earth, uh, things are much uh, more difficult between nations. So let's hope that this can be <laughs> an open... Yeah, please. An important thing with ISS, maybe Leopold told it before, told it before. Uh, is, a is a cooperation. I mean, uh, the, how many uh, countries are working? Uh, we're working on ISS. Bef there were five major partners, and within ESA, there were something like 12, 12 or 14 countries of ESA participating to ISS. 10, 10. So 10 plus 4, 14, 14 countries together, including Russian and American who were uh, enemy during the Cold War. I think the beauty of this sort of program is that we can cooperate and work together, speak together each other, uh, making science together, even in period where the political, at the political level, the country are fighting uh, each other. That was the case, for instance, for uh, the first flight of uh, Jean Lou when uh, he had this uh, flight opportunities, that was a time when the Soviet invaded Afghanistan. And uh, there was a, a big clash between Europe and France in particular with Mr. Giscard d'Estaing, who did not go for the launch of Jean Lou at the time. But nevertheless, uh, we continue to cooperate to uh, the scientists who are speaking together, leading uh, experiment together. This is uh, maybe if we can speak of strategy in terms of man flight, this point is really a strategic approach, allowing people to work, to speak of science, to work, to share their culture together, and preparing a sort of future, technology and science. Yes, I think that's clear about the, the science, the cooperation about science, and we have already a lot of cooperation in a scientific mission, not on manned uh, mission but a scientific mission in the solar system. I think maybe that's still in the operational cooperation, even I'm not speaking about technological, but operational, that need, we need really to build the, the trust, the, the confidence in each other. And um, that's true that maybe it's not completely mature. As it has been said this, uh, this morning with uh, non-information about the Long March 5 uh, return of the first, the first stage and uh, all, all these elements. So still, we have to work on it. Way to go, yes, yeah, still. And, and 
And so maybe the last question, uh, and even if we understand very well that astronauts are coming from very diverse horizons, whether from the military community, whether from the scientific community, engineering community, we're here at, at the Air and Space Force Academy. Um, I have a question. Um, do you think that human presence in space can have any consequence on, um, from a military perspective? Can human space flight be the next step of fighter pilots? <laughs> so like, maybe, I guess this is directed towards our former <laughs> cadets <laughs> from this academy. And of course, it's... Uh, Okay, it's I don't know how to answer that oriented. exactly, but uh, I think there is no country today who has a real, I mean, who have fighter pilots in, in space, <laughs> except in the, in the movies maybe today, but uh, it will take a lot of time. I think one of uh, the important thing I, I mentioned before was budgets, of course, and, and this is critical. Uh, having uh, um, a space force with uh, with uh, space, uh, let's say, um, pilots or space uh, crews, and um, it will be very expensive and, uh, for any country, even for the, for the US or Russia, who are uh, usually the leaders in this area. So uh, I don't think it will come soon, but it doesn't mean that space is not important for, uh, for uh, uh, air forces and, and, and for the military in general, of course. Thank you. Please. No, just to say that uh, a few months ago, the first guardian from the Space Force on board the ISS was celebrated, Mike Hopkins. Guardian, it's the name of the Space Force. It's not fighters. <laughs> but, uh, so, okay, That's true. So at the recognition <laughs> of the Space Force in the US, the guardian is there, what there. Okay, thank you very much. Maybe I would ask from each of you a last short word about what you would like to uh, convey to our audience and, and be, be beyond this particular audience to our uh, larger audience. Uh, maybe a, a strong feeling that this career has brought to you. Uh, maybe uh, something that more personal you would like to say or uh, a general remark. Soyez fiers d'être dans l'école de l'air et de l'espace. <laughs> I think you all share this. Be proud of being part of this Heron Space Academy. Uh, Heron Space uh, Academy. So thank you very much uh, uh, to you. We've been, I think, all very honored to have you uh, three on stage with us, sharing your experience and, and, and feelings. And I, I, uh, in my personal view, it's been a very rich conversation and with a very, very strong uh, emotional uh, uh, aspect. Um, so we are now closing this, uh, this panel and we will have now, I think, a uh, concluding word from uh, General Lavigne, who is the uh, uh, Air and Space Force, uh, uh, French Air and Space Force Chief of Staff. And so I think I will give now the floor to General Lavigne, who will be with us in, uh, in a video. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, dear participants to this seminar, I'm very pleased to talk to you this evening in front of such a prestigious audience to close this round table with our spacemen. I would like to congratulate the École de l'Air for this organization of this huge seminar, which allows you to collectively understand the issues related to this highly strategic environment, space. The seminar involves a large variety of high-level speakers in the space domain. I would especially like to thank the astronauts, former members of the Air Force or of our Air Force Citizen Reserve for their participation in this event which proves of great importance in your training course. I would also like to salute the presence of students from Allied Air Forces School who are attending through video conference 
and whose presence bears witness to the strong ties that bind our Air Force. It's an excellent way to familiarize our cadets with European space cooperation as well as initiate a space education partnership between European Academy. For the past two days, you have had the opportunity to discuss the challenges and perspective of space for our armed forces and beyond. That is why I would like to present you my vision of the challenges in space and outline how the Air and Space Force respond to these challenges and prepare the future of space operations. The global situation is evolving and quickly and we must now realize that the control of air and space is contested to a degree never seen in the post-Cold War era. Furthermore, the threats in the air are not only intensifying, but are now extending to exo-atmospheric space. The intensification of geopolitical tensions observed on the ground is thus extended into space. Such a reality pushes the limit of our action to 36,000 kilometers above us. We are also witnessing the democratization of satellite assets and the number of the country acting in space are now increasing from 30 to 70. In addition, a new class of non-predictive objects are now able to maneuver and interfere with our own assets. Some words about the evolution of conflict are foresee in air and space around 2030. First of all, in the air, air superiority, which is already contested, will be even more challenged in 2030. Conflicts will range from low to high intensity and will involve multi-means from hypervelocity missiles to low-cost drones with a saturation capacity. The increased use of access denial and paralysis strategies, cyber and electronic warfare assets will hamper the ability to add both ours and that of our adversary, adversary and will thicken the fog of the war as it will be complex to identify where hostile actions are coming from. Finally, the ability to connect assets in combat cloud is prone to accelerate the operational tempo. In the space domain, space, now a field of confrontation, is to become a new battlefield into 2030. Hostile action will be exercised in a remote control way in this non-sovereign environment, which is unregulated. We can fear an escalation between the major powers that will have the capacity to act and to arm each other in space. They will seek to deprive their adversaries of their ability to use the, this environment to their advantage, whether from the ground or via their satellite. And this battle can last just a few seconds, as space assets cannot be replaced easily. Evolutions of threats, emergence and use of new technologies, war does not subside, it transforms permanently. Thus, we need to prepare today for these tomorrow's conflicts. Faced with this reality, our freedom of access to air and space and our freedom of action could be threatened. How France and especially the French Air and Space Force, is to face these uh, challenges. Last month was rich of significant events in the field of space, especially with the successful launch of Mission Alpha, involving our French astronaut Thomas Pesquet, a tremendous ambassador for our nation. We are living in, in historic times in France, just as our institution and specifically with the transformation of the French Air Force into the French Air and Space Force. This new mission is a natural evolution of our field of responsibility as space is an extension of the third dimension. In outer space, our Air and Space Force has entered, as you know, in the implementation phase 
of the Defense Space Strategy presented by the Minister of the Armed Forces on the 25th of July 2019 at Lyon Montverdun Air Force Base. France's space strategy is ambitious. This strategy aims at strengthening our autonomy and ensuring our freedom of maneuver both for our access to space and our ability to act in space. First, it aims to respond to emerging threats. Second, it plans to take advantage of the opportunities offered by the new space in parallel with the know-how of our major industrial players in the space sector. The strategy also plans to find a balance between our own capabilities and the services provided by trust private operators and finally to expand cooperation in the field of operation in space and to open it up to new partners. In this context, the French Space Command was created on the 3rd of September 2019 within the French Air Force to address military space issues regarding to strategic breakthroughs to define a doctrine of operation in outer space and to run our new space assets, such as the new optical space comp component. Mainly based in Toulouse, at the heart of the French space ecosystem, the largest in Europe, the FSC is working in total synergy with the French space agency, the CNES. For the moment, it is a core structure of 270 women and men ramping up to 500 people in 2025 in Toulouse. The aim of the FSC is also to become a current C2 structure for military space operation and a military space academy in order to train military space experts and operators. The French Air Force Academy is part of this transformation and will soon change its name for the Air and Space Force Academy. Fully integrated in the space defense strategy at national level, the French Air Force Academy is currently broadening its training program in the field of space. Bachelor and master courses are undergoing a major program review, which will be implemented next year and will fully integrate our space program. Moreover, the Academy will soon be offering expert level space courses to officers and staff members in preparation for a leadership position in the space operation. Each year, a higher proportion of students join the Air Force Academy with space operation as their goal, coinciding nicely with our growing needs in this domain. The French Air and Space Force has now received its first officer, nicknamed Bébé Espace literally space baby, directly assigned to a space position after graduation from France's equivalent of the Air Force Academy. So we have more and more issues in space and we need to organize ourselves to deal with them. These allow me to make a natural link with the capability priorities that we have in the domain of space. France will spend more than 5 billion euros from now until 2025 to renew its space defense capabilities to start building a comprehensive and efficient defense space surveillance architecture and to develop a real capability to protect and defend our space assets. Obviously, 2025 is only a step and we are aiming for full capacities in terms of surveillance and defense means by 2030. We want to implement capabilities covering the entire spectrum, offering a wide range of options in order to be able to act continuously in a flexible and proportionate way and to face an adversary who will act below the threshold of armed conflict. In order to meet the challenges of the coming decades, we also demonstrate a great capacity for adaptation and agility. In space, we are developing innovative projects based on initiatives, including civilian ones. 
developed in the fast-growing field. The Enforce Space Innovation Laboratory, called LISA, set up by the Space Command and coordinated with the Defense Innovation Agency, actively monitors the space sector, both military and civilian, to capture and direct innovation and promote operational immersion. The Yoda Geostationary Demonstrator Project is also a good illustration of this agile innovation, since it uses a majority of technologies from the new space sector, but also works on space data using artificial intelligence techniques and high-performance processing technologies and experimentation with increasingly div diverse Earth and space observation solutions. In addition, last November, the Air Force Academy participated in an hackathon called Act in Space, an international innovation contest initiated by the French Space Agency, uniting 100 cities across five continents. This event, which took place for 24 hours non stop, only in virtual, is the largest in the world in its category. It allows young people, often students, to imagine launching a startup by taking up a challenge proposed by CNES and his partner, ESA, Airbus. I would particularly like to congratulate the team of the first year Air Force students who were one of the three teams awarded a prize in this event. Congratulations for this result and for your commitment. I often say in the air, as on the ground, you never win alone. And this is even more true in space. The space domain is by essence transverse and highly conductive to cooperation. The reinforcement of cooperation in the field of space is a major challenge to guarantee a peaceful and a responsible use of space and to, fi to face emerging threats. In this perspective, France joined uh, the Combined Space Operations Initiative last year. In addition, NATO just approved Paris' request to create a new Center of Excellence for Space in Toulouse. Planned for this summer, this center will welcome 42 experts, which one-third of foreign officers in charge of doctrine, analysis, training and exercises. We are also developing close ties with our training schools of our main partners in Europe and the presence of some of them today tears witness to this. For example, we have interesting prospects with our British friends, such as to build part of our training programs for our young officers together, including an exchange of instructors. As such, the challenge between cadets Project aims to have our students work together on a vision of air and space and air forces by 2040. In addition, as part of the Emilio Officer Exchange Program, our military Erasmus in Europe, the Air Force Academy is contributing to set up an international semester taught in English with in will include space-related courses. Cooperation in the field of education is thus a major issue in the space sector. This is also the case for operational preparation and this leads me to say a few words about the Asterix exercise held last March in Toulouse. Indeed, France led its first multinational military space exercise last month with Germany, Italy and the US, marking the country's efforts to reorganize its forces and operations to meet 21st century challenges. Asterix was a stress test for the country's space command, processes and systems, a tactical exercise meant to train and prepare space combatants. Asterix simulated an international crisis with no less than 18 different space events and scenarios ranging from an attack on a French satellite to space debris threatening civilian population to an adversary jamming a light satcom. With the presence of foreign observers, the, 
the exercise was also an opportunity to strengthen international cooperation, to move towards an increasing secure space environment in the service of freedom of action in space. I would like to conclude with the major challenges that I foresee for the air and space force in the future in space. Indeed, to adapt itself, reinvent itself, innovate, these are the challenges of the air and space force in a never more complex strategic environment. In space domain, finally, I identify three major issues. First, the multi-role, multi-purpose satellite, because carrying multi-payloads on a satellite platform will increase capabilities, but also facilitate certain combinations of effects. Like the Rafale, tomorrow's multi-role and multi-purpose satellites will be resilient and will allow for greater flexibility and agility. Second, moreover, data management in space will also be central, since the, in this environment where millions of objects are in transit, control is based on sensors, data collections and processing. And this is what condition the success and efficiency of object maneuvering. We also have connectivity issues in space, with the prospect of space network linking all our satellites, which will be able to communicate with each other, possibly have some autonomy in maneuvering for station keeping, and combine this with versatility. This logic of a space network made up of multi-role platform is a source of resilience, but also agility, notably by offering a better revisit rate. Finally, I would like to mention the prospect for laser-based optical communication between satellites and from satellites to the ground, sea or air. To conclude, I would like to address you cadets of the French Air Force Academy. Tomorrow, you will be immersed in the heart of a space operation within the framework of the serious game. You will really be the actors and you will be able to understand the reality of the challenges related to space. The same challenges you will encounter tomorrow in operations. Take full advantage of this experience and be inspired by, by the example of the astronauts who have honored us with their presence in this seminar. Be inventive, daring, and agile. It is no time for you to follow in their footsteps and write the history of the French Air and Space Force. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, too. Thank you. Yeah, okay, thank you very much on behalf of uh, all the cadets and the French Air Force Academy. See you tomorrow for the sales game, of course.